Okay, welcome back in, welcome back in. Welcome back in West Campus and South Campus. Uh, as I said, we've got a full day left and really excited. Um, you, you've heard a, a, a lot from Brett, and we're certainly thankful for him. We're going to change horses uh, for the rest of the day here and hear uh, from uh, our next speaker, Jeff Myers, who actually is the, the president of Summit and has dedicated the past 25 years of his life to raising up and equipping uh, that next generation to have these conversations that we're talking about. And so uh, nobody better uh, uh, than these two men that have come, and we're certainly uh, thankful for them. Uh, you may have seen him from everything from uh, Focus on the Family to Fox News, and so now you get him here, and you get to hear him uh, speak to us, uh, Christ Chapel. So please welcome uh, Jeff Myers. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. This, um, this time in which we live is in many ways a battle, and you're here because you recognize that's the case. But we sometimes forget what sort of battle it is. If you want to prevail in a battle, you have to know several things. You have to know the battleground. You have to know what it is that you're battling over, and you have to know what it is that you're battling against. And I've come to believe that the battle of our time is not a battle between Republicans and Democrats, or between red states and blue states, or between conservatives and liberals, that in fact, it's a battle over something more fundamental, and that is, what is truth? We just finished celebrating Easter, and just before Jesus went to the cross, Pilate, when Jesus said that he was the truth, asked him, what is truth? It's still the question of the day in which we live. And we're now in a place for the first time in American history at least, and perhaps the first time in recorded history, where the majority of people now say they believe that truth is up to the individual rather than something that is objectively so and can be discovered. Most of the issues that Brett was talking about and the reasons we use the strategies that Brett was sharing with you at Summit Ministries is because if you, can, if you address issues like politics or sexuality or, or whatever else and you haven't grappled with the fundamental issue of what is actually true and why people say there is no such thing as truth, then it's sort of like trying to manage the growth of an unwanted tree by clipping the branches when you need to go at the root. So how do we go at the root? Well, a lot of my life has revolved around this. I've had the privilege of being president of Summit Ministries for 10 years now. Before that, I was an entrepreneur, started several businesses, and was a professor of communication and leadership at a Christian college. Before that, back in school, I, went, I ha earned a Doctor of Philosophy degree. And before that, I was, I was a debate coach and high school and college level debater. And in the, in the debate world, you're presented with issues all of the time that you have to know something about and be prepared to argue about. So I had essentially become a professional arguer. That's how I earned scholarships to get me through college, much to the chagrin of my parents, especially my mother, who is a, an unprofessional arguer, but a very persistent arguer. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. In fact, when I grew up, it was, uh, it, was it, it looked like this. Detroit, Michigan was in the middle of riots. I was a tiny child. The riots were so bad in the city of Detroit that just to put this in perspective, because you lived through the summer of 2020, this, the riots were so bad in the city of Detroit that more people were injured, more people were killed, and more buildings were destroyed in the city of Detroit than in all of the United States put together in the year 2020. So it was an un unwelcome place. 
I was offered hard drugs for the first time at seven years of age. I watched the body of a heroin overdose victim be wheeled out of the house across the street. I remember cowering under my bed at the sound of a gunshot in the streets. My parents were not familiar with this world. My father worked in the computer industry, working with Ford Motor Company. My mother was a teacher. They had both grown up in Kansas and Oklahoma. And so when I was just about almost 10 years of age, we moved from Detroit, Michigan to Great Bend, Kansas. Here's a picture of Great Bend, Kansas during rush hour. (laughs) From a city of 1.7 million people to a city of 17,000 people. From a a church of 2,000 people to a church that was so small that our family of four increased attendance by 20% just by walking in the door. And I had a lot of, I mean, it was not, it was, a, it was a culture shock for my brother and for me. In fact, they said, we don't have any youth programs, so on Wednesday night, just play outside while we have our prayer service. People inside the church were praying. My brother and I were exploring. We discovered they had a shed. Inside the shed was a lawnmower. We both instantly knew what that meant. Wherever there's a lawnmower, there's gasoline. So we snuck back inside the church, found some Dixie cups, some masking tape, and some matches. We made a gasoline bomb and lit it in the parking lot during prayer meeting. (laughs) Incredibly enough, the next week, there was a youth group. (laughs) And so we went, my brother and me. We were the youth group. We loved the people in that church, and they loved us and prayed for us for decades. But you know, when it came to asking big questions in life, I wasn't finding satisfactory answers. I would ask, what do Christians think about this or that? And and to be fair, the people in that church, their faith journey did not take them through the street-level debates about apologetics that you're familiar with having come to several of these weekends at Christ Chapel. I began to believe, however, that the people in my church not only didn't have the answers, they didn't know what the questions were. And I quietly decided that when I graduated from high school, I would also graduate from church. It's a pretty familiar story, isn't it? We are told in different denominations with different kinds of studies, it's a very difficult thing to figure out that perhaps up to 70% of young adults who are significantly involved in church in their high school years are no longer even attending church by the time they reach their mid-20s. Somewhere along the way, something happens. For us at Summit Ministries, we think one of the big things that happens for most students is a college or university education. But we can't lay the blame at the feet of colleges necessarily. One study done by a sociologist who happens to be at Baylor University found that young adults who don't go to college abandon their faith at even higher levels than those who do go to college. So what happens in the middle of this situation? Well, I, my parents arranged for me to attend a two-week program at Summit Ministries. I showed up in Manitou Springs, Colorado at the historic Grandview Hotel, which is the headquarters of the program. I walked inside, and there is David Noble, the president of the ministry. I said to him, I hope you have a lot of answers because I have a lot of questions. I was 17. Do you know any 17-year-olds like that? If you're 17, you, I'm sorry. I just, that was me. I was so arrogant, but I was desperate to get answers. And David Noble said something life-changing to me. He did not say, don't worry, kid, we have all the answers. He said, at Summit, we aren't afraid of questions. I knew I had found my tribe. I knew all of a sudden that, not that answers are always easy to find. I knew answers are hard to find. I knew that. But to find somebody who not only knew there were big life questions, but that Christians were somehow responsible to engage with these questions, and that we didn't have to know everything, but we do have to be inquisitive and curious. We do have to study to show ourselves approved. I knew all of a sudden, whether I found more answers or not, these were the people I wanted to be around. So 
I was involved with Summit Ministries as a student for a couple of years. I came to a personal faith in Jesus Christ through that program. I came back through the program to help out in a couple of summers. I helped develop some curriculum material. I served as a speaker in the program. I served on the board. And when David Noble retired, he asked me to become the president of the ministry. So now I have the privilege of working with our team, which is now pretty extensive. Did you enjoy having Brett here with you last night and this morning? Brett's an amazing communicator and and a a regular part of our program. In fact, I think he's involved with every one of two-week Summit Ministries programs that we have. But we have 75 instructors now. And then we have 100 and some staff who mentor students during the summer program. And then we have a 60-person full-time staff. And then curriculum courses that go to Christian schools and homeschools and media outreaches. So the number of people we're able to reach has grown significantly, which is incredibly exciting. When you're in charge of something, it's nice to see it grow, right? It's nice to feel like, oh, yeah, there's some momentum here. Why is there momentum? Because people are so hungry to know the truth. And that is especially so with this rising generation. 75% of young adults say they lack any sense of purpose that gives them meaning in life. 53% say they regularly struggle with anxiety and depression. The worldviews that our society has presented to young people to give them the solutions for everything in life have left them even feeling more hopeless than before. So how do we understand the truth? How do we understand what's really happening in our culture? I'd like to back up a little bit and just do, and I don't want to get too nerdy in the philosophy stuff here, but there really are two conflicting views of truth that are... um, Uh, waging for us right now. You know, can I pause for a second? Because I just need to tell you, most people from Colorado speak at about 80 words a minute. I speak at about 150 words a minute with gusts up to 220 if I get really excited about something. And so can I just make you a deal right up front? You let me talk as fast as I want to. You scan this and it will send you all of the PowerPoints for all of my presentations. Is that okay? Is that a fair trade? All right, you just scan that, and I'll put it back up there again at the end, but scan that, and I will send you, uh, not only will I send you those notes, but it looks, uh, I'll send you, um, I'm going to send you information about a book I have coming out that covers a lot of what I'm talking about. It's called Truth Changes Everything. It doesn't come out until October, but it might be something you would be interested in in knowing about. But all of those presentations are going to be there, okay? Did you get it? You what? It's a good picture? Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Good. Now, I feel released to talk as fast as I want to. Are you ready? All right, let's dive in. Two conflicting views of truth. The first view of truth is that truth cannot, or truth can be known. The second view is that truth cannot be known. Okay? You don't have to try to remember what I'm going to say, but I'm just going to give a brief description. Truth can be known. The view says that ultimate truth exists. It exists independent of us. When you're asleep, truth still exists. When you're not paying attention, truth still exists. Importantly, listen to this, when you're deceiving yourself, truth still exists. Okay? That's the ultimate truth idea. Our job then is to persuade others to respond to it. What is truth like? Well, how do we access it? We're going to get into this a little more later, but reason and revelation are two key terms. All right, the second view, the dominant view of today, is that truth cannot be known. Truth is up to the individual. No one is in a position to discover what is ultimate truth. The best we can do is speak our truth. You see the difference between these two views? The first view says, seek the truth. The second one says, speak your truth. Seek the truth versus speak your truth. Have you heard people today say, just speak your truth? If something bad has happened to you, do you need to learn how to use your voice so you can communicate it so that people will move toward justice? No question, you do. But where we are in the culture today is that 50% of Americans say they believe truth is up to the individual. Ninety-some percent of Americans say the best way to find truth is to look with inside yourself. Looking inside of yourself 
When I think of that, I try to imagine those days where I've been out in the wilderness hiking in Colorado, using a compass to guide myself. Thinking that the truth is inside of you is sort of like navigating using a compass by making sure that the red needle always points to you. You're not more found, you're more profoundly lost if you do that. It's no wonder to me that people are having such a difficult time. But how do people justify this view? Because you say, that didn't just come out of nowhere. That isn't something that they just sort of, you know, subliminally put on Sesame Street or on Disney, and then, you know, everybody starts believing it. No, the people who believe that truth cannot be known advocate that view four different ways. I'm just going to review this very briefly. First, they say that truth is whatever helps you win. Stanley Fish is a First Amendment scholar, a law professor, and an English professor. He said, you are entitled to your own facts if you can make them stick. In other words, it's because there is no truth, the most persuasive people automatically get to win. That is what's called sophism. Second, second view is that truth is just window dressing. This is in philosophy what they call deflationism. So, if you, let me just give you this illustration. If you say, it is true that the sun rose, and then you have another sentence, the sun rose, saying it is true that the sun rose doesn't add any meaning to the statement, the sun rose. Therefore, discussions about truth add no meaning to what we're talking about. It's just window dressing. A third view is that truth is in the eye of the beholder. You've heard people say this, perception is reality, people will say. Truth is in the eye of the beholder. That's called pluralism. And then a fourth view is that truth is whatever works. Like we have to decide as a society, ultimately we have to choose. We can't do everything all of the time. We have to choose how we're going to use our resources. How we do that depends on what works. The truth isn't something that exists. It's that you know can exist. It's something that sort of, as one of my professors said, you know truth when it hits you over the head. Like there is reality out there, but you can't really ultimately know what it is. You just focus on what works. Of course, the question is, what works for whom and when and how and all of those things? Those are the big questions. All right, does that make sense? That's where people who say truth cannot be known, that's where they're going with it. I think these four views, while they have an interesting aspect of them, fail when we're talking about anything important. So, a sophist is correct. You do have to argue for your viewpoint. Even Scripture says that you should be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have, 1 Peter 3.15. The second view, deflationism, does point out that people often flippantly use the idea of truth. You hear it all of the time, that's true, or you lied, or whatever. They flippantly use the idea of truth without really thinking through what it means. Pluralism helps us understand that we have to distinguish between facts and opinions. Pragmatism does help us understand that we do have to learn to live together, right? I mean, if anybody grew up in, um, in, a, in, in a country that was British, or an area like, okay, Australia maybe, New Zealand, South Africa, uh, Great Britain, it, what's different about driving in those countries? Yeah, yeah, you're driving on the other side of the road. So we drive on the right side of the road, in those countries you drive on the left side of the road. It's very disorienting. If you're driving there and you go, to, you go to get a rental car, the steering wheel is not on the left-hand side of the car, it's on the right-hand side of the car. And invariably, unless you paid a lot of money, you're going to get a stick shift, which means it's on the left-hand side. It's exactly the opposite of the way an American grew up. Is it wrong? Is it morally wrong? I don't know. I mean, it's hard to make a case. It's, it's irritating. I wish they didn't do it that way, but it's just, it's a preference. Some countries do it differently. It's not so important if people drive on the right or on the left in a certain country. It's that we all agree that we will do it the same way. You can't have half the people deciding I'm going to drive on the right and half people saying I'm going to drive on the left. Or somebody saying, you know, this is a left-hand day for me. Everybody else just has to watch out. 
No, it's, it's a matter of preference. So th there is some truth to this idea that we just have to agree on some things that we, in order to just live together. But when you're talking about anything important, so for example, you can't have a tax rate that is 40% and 75% on the same group of people at the same time. You cannot have abortion on demand at any point during the pregnancy and limits on abortion at the same time in the same way. When you're talking about anything that we have to really figure out to live together in society, you really need to know that there is truth that can be found, that it can be discovered. So what are some reasons to believe that truth can actually be known? Let me give you these four briefly, and then I'll kind of explain how at Summit Ministries we help students develop the discernment necessary to pull this off. Because if you think about it, you know, Brett talked about same-sex attraction. That is one of maybe 400 issues that you have to face in society today. How do we think about all of these things is really where I wanted to focus my time. So what are some reasons to believe that truth can be known? Well, the first one is that truth tends to emerge. Have you ever, have you ever noticed that when somebody says, well, you um, have your truth, I have my truth, that they have not only claimed to know what is true for themselves, they've claimed to know what is true for you? Have you noticed that? If someone says, there is no such thing as truth, what have they just done? Proclaim the existence of a truth. I was baffled by this when I first went to college. I didn't know yet that all of my professors, virtually all of them, believe that truth is up to the individual. So I just started asking really pesky questions. Like one professor, he stood before us and he said, I just want you to know that everybody's opinions in this class are true. And the immediate thought that went into my debate mind, which I did not say aloud, was, so if I say you are an idiot, I'm right? I didn't say it. I kind of held on to it. No one in this class has the right to impose their morality on anyone else. So I just waited. Exam day rolls around. He's handing out all of the tests. I raise my hand, Professor, is it okay if we cheat? And he looked at me and said, no. Like, it was kind of, it's one of those classes where the professor and the students had a pretty good relationship, so you could get away with asking impudent questions. Can we cheat? No. I said, why not, professor? Are you imposing your morality on us? I could see some of my classmates laying down their pencils like, yes, <laughs> Myers might win this one. Okay? It's Myers versus the professor. Advantage Myers. He said, well, when you came into this class, you were given a syllabus, and the syllabus is a social contract between you and me. By staying in the class, you've agreed to abide by the terms of the syllabus, and therefore, you've already prescribed the range of behaviors in which you will engage, and cheating is not among those behaviors. I said, but when I came in this class, I was ignorant and unenlightened. I did not know that it's wrong for a person to impose their morality on anyone else, so I feel that it's unfair for you to hold me to a standard that I agreed to in a previous state of ignorance. And he said, well, ultimately, ultimately cheating hurts only you. And I said, but professor, I didn't study for this test. I don't think cheating would hurt me. I think it would help me. <laughs> and by the way, who are you to tell me what helps me and what hurts me? Are you trying to impose your morality on me? Then I got the look. <laughs> I said, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm not going to cheat on the test. I just wanted to see, you know, how this whole moral relativism thing plays out. Uh, but truth emerges, doesn't it? When someone says, you can't possibly know what is true for me, they're not just telling you what is true for them, they're telling you what is true for you. No matter how you talk about truth, you end up talking about it in a way that presumes its existence. The, is this helpful? Okay, the second thing, I hope it is, I have no plan B. It's like, yeah, this is it. All right, I've got no other slides. Um, this one's a little more nuanced, but it's really important. Things and ideas have essences. So I put a picture up here of a sports car. If you're a sports car fan, you'll immediately recognize this is a Ferrari F12 Berlinetta. If I were to say to you, a Ferrari F12 Berlinetta is a cool sports car, 
The person who believes that truth is up to the individual doesn't hear a description of the car. They hear a description of my preferences. Does that make sense? Like they're just saying, well, we don't really know anything more about the car. All we know is what you think is cool and what you define as a sports car. But this car does have an essence that emerges through time. There's a philosopher named Edmund Husserl who, who counteracted the idea that, you know, it's only your perceptions that matters. He says, no, ideas and things have essences, and they are intended to have essences. All the time when people say there's no such thing as ultimate justice, truth is up to the individual, well, if they perceive an injustice, what do they immediately do? That's unjust. Well, if there's no such thing as justice, we can't even make that determination. We can't know the way we ought to be as a society, as a society unless we have some sense of oughtness. So Husserl said, ideas like justice and liberty have meaning. Even when we disagree about them, we always make sure that we're disagreeing about the same thing. That's really significant to understand. A third thing is that words are meaningful. Now, a word is not the same thing to which it refers, right? Words are words, things are things. We use words to refer to things. And so a lot of times people who say, well, the truth is up to the individual, just say, well, you use words however you want. There's no real thing there. It's just the way you use your words. But words are meaningful. So if I went into a Paris furniture store and I pointed to that and said, what is that? The clerk would say, un chair. It's a chair. Well, it's a different word than I use for chair, but we do both recognize, even though we're speaking a different language, that we are referring to a chair as distinct from other objects we might find in a furniture store. Now, again, I don't want to get too deep into the philosophy of this, but it's important to understand that we, even when people say things like, there's no such thing as truth, they intend for those words to mean something to you about the nature of truth. They're not randomly using words. Because when people randomly use words, we know that they're not right mentally. You've, you've seen this, and it's a very sad situation, but it's not something that we would expect to encounter in a classroom. All right, fourth thing is the knowable difference between facts and opinions, okay? And after this, I'm done with the philosophy. I just wanted to kind of lay the groundwork here. But there's a knowable difference between facts and opinions. A fact is something you can know to be true. An opinion is an interpretation of the fact. So when somebody says, our senator is a racist, Today, when people believe that truth is up to the individual, they think they're making a statement of fact, but they're not. They're interpreting a whole lot of different things and assuming that words have some kind of a meaning and using all of that to create an impression that things are one way rather than another. When somebody says, uh, you know, any different kind of thing, you can kind of imagine how, how these kinds of things play out. But there are facts and here's the thing, there are scientific facts, we know this. Like if somebody said, if you said to a person, you know at sea level water boils at 212 degrees, it would be silly for that person to say to you, well maybe that's true for you, but how dare you impose your view on me? Be like, no, that's the way it is. You can't change that. If somebody said, so we know there are scientific facts, there are historical facts. If you said Martin Luther King was shot on April 4th, 1968, and the person said to you, well, maybe that's true for people in your culture, but that's not true for people in my culture. No, no, that's when it happened. If we all know what we're talking about using the same calendar as a reference, we can find the historical material to see that that is so. But not only are there scientific facts and historical facts, there are also moral facts. Have you ever thought about this? When people say they believe truth is up to the individual, what they're primarily saying is that all morals are opinions. But we don't believe that. Who believes that? You've heard of this group called PETA, P-E-T-A. It stands for People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. I had a friend who was a hunter. He got a bumper sticker for his truck that said PETA, P-E-T-A, and underneath it said People Eating Tasty Animals. There is a difference, and we know it between 
people for the ethical treatment of animals and people eating tasty animals. There's a meaningful difference between those two things. In the same way, there's a meaningful difference between it is good to care for abandoned puppies and it is good to torture abandoned puppies. We know the difference between these things. So there are moral facts as well. Flannery O'Connor, a great novelist, put it this way, truth doesn't change by our ability to stomach it emotionally. So, we've got a little bit of a groundwork. We know what people mean when they say truth is up to the individual. We have some sense of how we, we, why we might think that truth actually exists out there. The question is, how do we find it? How do we find truth? Some truths are easy to discover. If you were in a science class and the professor said, well, um, a water molecule is made up of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. The students don't say, boo, you're intolerant. No, they just write it down, because like, that's the way it is. When we, and, and, if, and if a student did do something like that, the teacher would consider it to be a poor answer, even if it was a Christian student. If you said, describe chemo, the chemical reaction of combustion, and a student says, I don't know, maybe God does it, right? We would not consider that to be a poor answer, or we would consider that to be a poor answer, even if the student is a very nice person, right? So we, we recognize that somehow we've got to figure out how to discover truth. Well, this is interesting. Jesus talked about truth a lot. In fact, he said in John 8, 32, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And all of a sudden, as he talked with his disciples, they realized truth exists, and truth is not just a set of mathematical formulas. It's not just a series of logical propositions. Truth is a person. It's Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. So we do need to know that we can know truth. What's fascinating to me, and as I, I finish this book, just in fact, I finished it three days ago, sent the final edits off to the publisher, comes out in October. The whole book is, there's a meaningful difference between truth, capital T, and truths, the idea that truth is up to the individual. And I demonstrate that just by looking back in, in history. How did people who believe that Jesus is the truth really change the course of civilization? And it's fascinating to see some of these things. So, for example, you have people like this. Johannes Kepler was, was a Christian and a scientist. And he said, I was merely thinking God's thoughts after him. Since we astronomers are priests of the highest God in regard to the book of nature, it benefits us to be thoughtful, not of the glory of our minds, but rather, above all else, the glory of God. I thought, well, you know, he's, it's, okay, you could always have one weird scientist amid all of the others, right? But let's look back. So I look back in history. You know what I found? Of the 52 individuals who were responsible for the development of modern science, only one of them was an atheist. Only one. I never knew that. I went and got a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD. No one ever told me that. I was always left with the impression that all smart scientists are atheists. They have to be by definition. 52, only one was an atheist. In fact, John Lennox, who's a professor of mathematics at Oxford University, found that of the people who've received a Nobel Prize in science, two-thirds of them list Christian as their religious affiliation. Still to this day, it's unbelievable to see how people who start with the idea that Jesus is the truth are the ones who have changed everything else in culture. But second thing, we have to be able to understand the error. So if there is such a thing as truth, that means there is a category of things that are wrong. They're misleading. I think of them as counterfeits. So I was in a foreign country, and a, and a, a man came up to me, and he said, hey, do you want to buy a real fake Rolex? <laughs> it's like, I don't, how do I respond? Because native, he was not a native English speaker, and what's funny about that statement in English is because, you know, a double negative makes a positive, right? So I wanted to say to him, are you sure it's a real fake? 
You know all these people in these stores with all the security guards? They're selling fake fakes. I thought that was very funny in my jet lag mind. Made no sense to him. What he was telling me is that his fake watch looked more real than the other watches, which actually makes it more fake, right? It does. So there are counterfeits, and, you, and, and, and the most dangerous counterfeits are the ones that look a lot like the truth but lead to ultimate error. That's why the Apostle Paul said, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to obey Christ. All right, so we got to figure out how to discern truth. we got to figure out how to discern the error. How are we going to do this? Here's the key word. If you remember nothing else from the time we have this morning, just remember this, patterns. Ideas flow in patterns. Everything flows in patterns. If you want to be successful in business, you have to identify the patterns of success for that business. If you want to be successful in a sport, you have to identify the principles of success, the patterns that apply to that sport, right? I remember uh, visiting with a friend of mine who was a professional tennis player, and I asked him, do you ever play Andy Roddick? He said, oh, yeah. Because Andy Roddick... He, his tennis serve was so wicked, he could serve the tennis ball at 156 miles an hour. Can you imagine that? You know how small a tennis court is. Somebody wound up and hit an object toward you at 156 miles an hour in that short of space, that could be considered assault with a deadly weapon. I said, did you, did you ever hit him back? I said, because I read a study from UCLA, and they said, oh, you can't... Um, the, the, in tennis, the ball is moving so fast that it's physiologically impossible to hit it back. I said, but people hit it back all of the time. The only way it turns out for those professional tennis players to hit the ball back is for them to hit the ball before their brain realizes it has arrived. Wow. What is it? It's reflex. It's training. Over time, you learn. And Andy Roddick... You know, he's a pretty straightforward um, guy who has a strategy. In certain scoring situations, this is typically what he does. If you know that piece of information, you can make a guess. Is the ball going to come on your right side or your left-hand side? And then you can respond appropriately and set up your own strategy. It happens at lightning speed. But in the world of ideas, it's the same thing. I think that's why we called our material that some ministry is the book that David Noble and I wrote, Understanding the Times, based on 1 Chronicles 12.32. We wanted to talk about the tribe of Issachar. Why? Because they had an understanding of the times. What does it mean? They knew the patterns that were of what was happening in the culture of their time. There were 200 chiefs and all their kinsmen under their command. Fascinating thing is the tribe of Issachar is not known by how many troops it had. It was known by how many leaders it had. Because if you know how to understand the times, it's less important how many people are on your side. That you, you have influence as a leader. All right. So ideas flow in patterns too. Let me give you a quick example, and then I'm going to show you what these patterns of ideas are. We're going to wrap it up, take a break. And then when I come back, what I'd really like to do is really two things. First of all, how do you create a safe place for talking about tough things like truth? You know, when I, I, I arrived partway during Brett's talk this morning, and as I was listening to that, I realized um, he, he's not only teaching you material, he's teaching you how to interact with other people, which is so cool. And I'll, I'll show you in a few minutes why that's, that is, that's such a good approach. But... What I'd like to do is, is kind of back up a little bit and ask, how do you even get in those conversations to begin with? Because you all know that if you have a friend who is in the LGBTQ movement and they know you're a Christian, you go to Christ Chapel, it's not going to come up. They're not going to talk to you unless you have the kind of relationship that brings up the possibility of conversations. In other words, to be safe. And I, I, I really struggled with what to call this talk. I ended up calling it um, something about how to create safe, a safe place to talk. 
And I thought, I'm nervous about that because on a college campus, safe spaces, oh man, you know what that means. When you get triggered by reality, you can go to the safe space and reclaim your level of insanity, right? This is your escape from reality. You go there so that you don't have to think. Instead, as Christians, we want to create safe places where people can think. So it's exactly the opposite. But we'll come back and talk about how to do that. All right. So do ideas have consequences? Let me give you a quick illustration. After World War II, the Korean Peninsula split. You all know about this. You remember reading about the Korean War in history class. South Korea basically went toward Christianity. It wasn't that everybody in South Korea was Christian, but that the leaders of the country took Christian faith seriously, and they still do in many ways today. Have you been to Korea? If you're hanging out with Christians in Korea, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to talk until 1 o'clock in the morning, then you're going to wake up at 5.30 in the morning, and you're going to pray for three hours before you do anything else. Okay, that's just the day of a Korean Christian. North Korea, on the other hand, went toward communistic atheism. Do you think that it made a difference on the first day between those two countries? No. Do you think it made a difference in the first week? Maybe, maybe not. How about the first year? Would you start to notice a difference between the two? Probably. What if you let it go for 50 or 60 years? Not only would you see a difference, but the difference is so noticeable you can see it from outer space. You see South Korea there, well-lit and prosperous, North Korea almost literally in the dark ages. It's so incredible that North, uh, the North, in North Korea, the gross domestic product is about $1,800 per person. In South Korea, it's $32,400. So people are almost 20 times as uh, prosperous. Infant mortality in South Korea, 4%. North Korea, 26%. One out of every four babies dies from malnutrition or lack of care. And this is the 21st century. Ideas have consequences. What you believe really does matter. So uh, when we talk about this at Summit Ministries, we say we want you to understand the battle of worldviews. A worldview is a pattern of ideas. That's all it is. Just think of it as a pattern of ideas. And we point out six different worldviews. We talk about the Christian worldview, but we also expose our students to Islam, secularism, Marxism, new spirituality, and postmodernism. And if you want to know more about those, the book Understanding the Times goes into detail about it. If you want it at a, you know, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm with you, I want to know a little bit more, but it's not like I have all the time in the world to read a philosophy book. My book called Secret Battle of Ideas About God puts it in a narrative form that's very straightforward and will show you how all of these ideas play out. So we pick six. The Christian worldview, five worldviews that I refer to as counterfeit worldviews. Do they have something important to say? Are they believed? Are they taken seriously by a lot of people? Yes, they are. Do we condemn people? No. But we do recognize that they may know a little bit of the truth, but don't see the whole picture. Why did we pick these five counterfeit worldviews? Because if you take, well, if you take those and the Christian worldview all together, what you end up with is pretty much 95% of the ideas that are influential in Western civilization. The idea of understanding patterns is, doesn't mean that you have to understand everything, right? Somebody says, well, that map is not completely accurate. You don't want a map that's completely accurate. A map that's completely accurate would be as big as the city that the map is of. What you want is a map that accurately represents what's going on in that city. Does that make sense? So, we look at these six different worldviews. We could have added other worldviews. In Great Britain, um, but you know in America when people take the census, did you notice they asked you what your religious preference was? Did you know that you don't have to answer that question? Most people don't. Most Americans are like, I'm not answering all this. That's why census workers have to go door to door because people throw away the thing because they're asking not only how many people live in your house, which is the legal constitutional question, they also ask things like, what's your stock portfolio or whatever. Like, it's actually none of your business. In other countries, they answer every question. Switzerland, they answer every question. Oh, the government needs to know. You know, they answer everything. In Britain, they don't do that. They don't throw it away. They don't answer every question. They try to trick the government. It's hysterical. 
So the government said, we're sending out our census. We're going to ask you, what is your religious preference? And people are like, oh, put down this or put down that. That's how 176,632 people in Great Britain became Jedi. <laughs> so you could put, you could, you could have a lot of different worldviews that go on here. But the point that I wanted to get to is, when you talk about a Christian worldview, you're, you're essentially saying what you believe about God will determine what you believe about what is real. What you believe about what is real will determine what you believe about what's right or wrong. What you believe about what's right or wrong will determine what you believe about what makes life valuable to begin with. What you believe about the value of life will determine what you believe about the value of a person. What you believe about the value of a person will determine what you believe about what makes a good society. What you believe about what makes a good society will determine what kind of political system you have, what kind of a legal system you have, what kind of an economic system you have, and ultimately how you see the flow of history as a whole. Then you look at these other worldviews and ask the question, do they line up? Do they answer the big questions about God, nature, and reality? Does that, does that make sense? So when somebody says, oh, you know, Christians were, who in science were the ones who changed the world, aren't we awesome as Christians? Actually, the totally wrong approach. We, instead, we go back and ask, what was it that they got right that we can understand and apply in our own society. It's not about you as an individual. It's about God and his work in the world. Does that make any sense at all? Okay. Um, uh, part of what I was going to do is share with you some questions that you can ask. I'm going to do that a little bit more in a few minutes. Uh, Brett took care of a lot of that. What I want to do before we take a break, though, is show you, if I can pull up one more slide here, how, if you want to start your own little library, if you, if you, anybody want to be a summit nerd, you're like, what these kids do sounds actually pretty cool. I wish they had something like this for adults. So the, one of the first things we tell students is, if you want to be a leader, you've got to be a reader. If you want to be a leader, you've got to be a reader. Okay, newsflash, the greatest ideas of, not, of all time are not on CNN. They weren't on CNN Plus. <laughs> They're not even on Fox News. They're not even on Netflix. They're not on TV at all. They're in books. The people who lead the world invariably are people who study, people who read. So we put together, a, along with a Baker Publishing out of Grand Rapids, Michigan, we have a worldview imprint called the Summit Ministries Series. And there are several books that are part of this. Unquestioned Answers is a book I wrote um, because I know a lot of people have unanswered questions, but as Christians, we have to be careful of our unquestioned answers, things that we think we know but we really don't. So when we run into trouble... We, our views fall short because we haven't really studied it. Challenging Conversations, my favorite, one of my favorite books from the last two years by Jason Jimenez. How do you actually talk about tough issues? And he covers mental illness, same-sex attraction, marriage, abortion. He covers all of the hot topics. Secret Battle of Ideas About God shows the battle of ideas and how you face it. And then Why You Matter by Mike Sherrard talks about the question of identity because it seems to be an issue that so many young adults are struggling with. It's not just sexual identity, it's who, how, who am I at all? Well, if you take on a materialist or secular worldview, then you're your body. If you are your body, then you are whatever your chemistry tells you you are. So if, you're, if you feel that because of your chemicals in your brain, that you're one thing or another, that's what you are because your body is all you are. But if we're made in God's image, it's a totally different question. Does that make any sense? All right. So I'm going to try to make this practical when we come back. I'm going to focus on how do you create a place where you can safely and regularly talk about and, uh, and your faith and all other kinds of things so that people tend to trust you 
as the sort of individual who can lead them well. And then the final talk that I'm going to give is 10 ways to win the hearts and minds of Gen Z because the rising generation is just not there. I mean, I'm looking around the room right now and saying this, you know, this is kind of an illustration of that. The rising generation is less Christian, less oriented to church, more socialistic, and more focused on moral relativism than any generation that has ever lived in the history of America. So you, talk, you try to talk to them. And what makes it so difficult? They're like, oh, Grandma, you're just being a fascist, right? Like, you, they don't even hear you because they've already been trained to not hear people who say things like the things you are saying. So what do you do in that situation? How do you talk to people like that? How do you bring, tr bring truth in that kind of a world? Would that be helpful? All right, that's where we're going to go right after lunch.